Hi guys, it is Mrs. Sloan, and this is part two of chapter 33. And um, let me make myself a little bit smaller here. And I just wanna review real quickly what we have already gone over. Let me get this in present. Oh no, actually, I'm gonna leave it right here. So we talked about the organization of life, right? Um, and we talked about um, rate of increase, right? Looking at births minus deaths over total population. And we'll revisit that again. We looked at biotic potential, maximum reproduction. And we looked at, when you look at biotic potential, you look at when age of first reproduction, average number of offspring, how often each individual reproduces and chance of survival until age of reproduction. We then compared two types of growth curves, the exponential growth curve. This is eat and drink first, tomorrow we may die. So they're just going for maximum offspring. They're not really investing in their young. And then we looked at the logistic growth model, which is um, that you still have a lag and you still have an exponential phase, but then it hovers right at the carrying capacity. These are usually larger organisms. We also looked at survivorship curves. If you remember, there are three types of survivorship curves, type one, type two, type three. Type one, you survive throughout your full lifespan. Type three is the opposite where most juveniles die early and then type two is in between. So you're, those are the extremes, you probably fall somewhere in between that. And we looked at different characteristics there. Okay, then we looked at the human population growth. We looked at MDCs and LDCs. And we also made the observation that though more developed countries are a smaller percentage of people, we create the most hazardous waste, use the most paper, metals, and fossil fuels. And lastly, we looked at age structure diagrams between an LDC and an MDC. And again, in the link below, I have a great video I would like you to watch um, about population size and how populations transition in an LDC to an MDC and what it takes in order to do that. All right, and then this tees us up for um, part two in chapter 33, um, where we're going to look at um, the regulation of population growth, all right? So first, um, let's do a quick comparison between an opportunistic life history pattern and an equilibrium life history pattern. Let me tell you something right now. I'm not teaching you anything new over here. We're just applying what we learned earlier, okay? Um, and you'll see it here. It's easy peasy lemon squeezy. Let me go over here. All right. So, um, first of all, if you look at opportunistic versus equilibrium, okay, opportunistic taking advantage of the opportunities, look at the growth curve below there, the exponential growth curve, right? So there's a dead banana. Let's have 10,000 babies so we can eat this banana. Whereas in the equilibrium model, maybe they only produce two cups. Right now, I've got something really cool going on in my backyard. Uh, Mr. Sloan and I do uh, today. Um, and this is, what is today? July 27th, 2020. We have four owls in our backyard. Three are um, juvenile and there's a parent and they're just hanging out in our backyard all day. And one was not flying between the trees as much as the other um, two were. And I'm wondering if he's gonna or she's gonna make it um, because what the mom wants to do is invest in those young that are going to survive and reproduce because there is a carrying capacity. There's only so much um, food available, resources available. All right. So that's an equilibrium model. I'll keep you posted on the um, owls and maybe post some pictures for you too. So taking a look first at the opportunistic pattern. So here we're looking at a bunch of cockroaches. So this is maximum R. They're, they they are only thinking about, let's have a lot of births, right? So they're trying to maximize their, their growth rate. And so characteristic of that opportunistic species, let me go up, I am just too big. Let me make myself smaller. Here we go. Characteristics of the opportunistic species, they tend to be very small they have a very short lifespan. So since they're small and a short lifespan, they gotta get on it quickly. That's why they mature quickly and they produce many offspring and they usually don't survive to take care of those offspring. So if you've read Charlotte's Web, um, you know what I'm talking about or spoiler alert, 
Um, Charlotte, um, she dies at the end. Um, after, you know, she builds a bunch of webs um, to save Wilbur the pig. But all of her offspring, the thousands of spider offspring, they do not need her other than to get made. They don't need her to teach anything. There's no hunting skill she's passing on. They have that behavior. It is innate within them. So that is the opportunistic species. So on your notes, what you need to fill in and remember, um, the notes are in the uh, video descriptor at the bottom. There's a link to the notes. Remember the first column is the scaffolding of the notes. You want to fill in any of the blanks. And on the right, you want to add supportive pictures and images um, with the material. All right. Okay. So opportunistic pa um, pattern, maximize their rate of natural increase, tend to be colonizers, tend to be colonizers. They have a J-shaped growth curve. Remember the J-shaped exponential J-shaped growth curve. Their traits, you have all the traits right there small, short lifespan, mature, fast, etc., And they tend to be regulated by density independent factors, density independent factors. So put a pin in that because I'm going to come back to that and I'm going to explain that to you in just a minute about density independent factors versus density dependent, though I bet you could figure it out. All right. So now let's co compare this to an equilibrium pattern. This is all about the K, that K stands for carrying capacity. And so these populations tend to live right at their carrying capacity. And so they are more competitors, not colonizers. They are fighting for a spot, right? Because there is a finite number of spots within their ecosystem, right? So they are fighting for that spot. So they're competitors, not colonizers. They're called equilibrium species. And, um, you can see their traits. They tend to be larger, right? They have a long lifespan, very slow to mature. They care for their very few offspring. So on your notes, populations are near their carrying capacity. Um, they are strong competitors. They tend to be specialists, right? Tend to be specialists. And they could become extinct when their very um, highly evolved way of life is disrupted. They have an S-shaped growth curve, S-shaped, remember, it's log, exponential, and then hover at the carrying capacity. That's the S-shaped growth curve. Their traits, you're going to want to watch, or sorry, write down all of these traits in your notes, type them in your notes. Um, large, long lifespan, slow to mature, produce few offspring, and they tend to care for their offspring. All right? So pause that if you need to get caught up in, in those notes. All right, so now let's talk about how population sizes are regulated. And there are both density independent and density dependent. So which one do you think do numbers matter? Number one or number two? Hopefully you said number two, because that's a density dependent factor. These are some sort of factors that keep the population from increasing indefinitely and control the growth rate. So if it's that rotten banana right there, um, then you have gnats or fruit flies all over it. They're going to go until that banana is gone. And it's not a factor of how many gnats there are or fruit flies. It's when the banana got thrown away. Density dependent factors are more like the owls in my backyard right now. There's only so many nesting sites. There's only so much food. So will all three baby owls survive? I don't know. When you look at these um, factors, some of these factors are living. That would be a biotic factor. Like, do they have enough food, right? Because it's going to be a predator. And some are not. Those are abiotic factors. Like temperature is an abiotic factor. pH is an abiotic factor. All right? So on your notes, as we're going to start to transition, I'm going to, I'm going to spell both, uh, both of those out. So first of all, just take a quick look. I don't think this part is difficult, comparing and contrasting abiotic with biotic. All right. So notice on this biotic, you'll see this word symbiosis, and we're going to come back to that, okay? But symbiosis is two different species interacting and there can be a lot of outcomes with that but usually it's always good for one mutualism is when it's good for both parasitism is it's good for one not so much for the other you and i um teacher student are not in a symbiotic relationship do you know why even though yes tax dollars pay my salary and you get an education do you know why we're not in a symbiotic relationship 
hopefully you know, okay, it's because we're the same species. So symbiosis is when it's two different species, and we'll come back to that too. All right, so here we go. Um, let's look at density independent factors. Now, they have no correlation, and you can see this on your notes, no correlation between um, with population size. So for instance, a tornado, tornado doesn't care if it goes through a town of 10, a thousand or 10,000 tornadoes happen. It is independent of the population size, yet it can regulate the population size. Density independent factors like this, they tend to be abiotic, non living, non living. So things like weather, okay, or floods. So here you can see another density independent factor. Here's flooding. The flooding is occurring not because of the numbers of individuals that live there, just because something broke, a dam broke, or there was a lot of rain, um, right? Same thing with drought. All right. When you have a flood, a density independent factor strikes or impacts the small population on the left as much as it impacts the larger population on the right. So it impacts them equally. So let's get some notes down on this. Okay, so density independent factors, there is no correlation with population size. They are abiotic. And then write down some examples like flash floods or hurricanes. All right, very good, that's easy. All right, now let's look at some density dependent factors. So this does depend on the population size. And usually these factors are biotic, living. Okay, so obviously there's a dispute going on here. Um, somebody wants to be in charge, actually both somebody's. So there's some competition, there's some fighting to decide who is. So um, this is correlated with population size. It tends to be biotic, hopefully you wrote that down. And competition is one of those examples. Okay, now disease and parasites can regulate a population size. And what happens is when there's increased density, right, when there's increased density, then there's greater likelihood that that pathogen, that virus, that disease is going to spread more readily between the populations. Let's apply this to COVID, right? In New York, really, really dense populations in New York easy to spread that. Hence the reason you have mass, hence the reasons you're trying to be six feet from anybody because you're trying to make it harder for that pathogen to spread, okay? This is not political, it's just science, okay? And whether a virus can get from one individual to another, all right? So disease um, is disease and parasites are another way that you can regulate population size. Um, competition. If there's a good place for food acquisition, to mate, to get mates, competition, that is a density dependent factor. Okay, obviously, whoever can use their lightsaber the best. This is competition. All right, now, you can have competition between the same species, like these squirrels are all the same species, right? That's, that's competition within a, pop, within a population. So one squirrel is competing with another squirrel, okay? Or you can have competition between different species, okay? This would be within a community. So I think there's something dead in the middle of this. And so you have some different birds and it looks like a hyena all wanting to have that. Okay, so competition, again, another example of density dependent factors that would regulate population size. Okay, next what we want to do is you want to look at competition with, I, oh, I need you to get that definition down there. And let me go back one, my bad. Okay, um, so add this to your notes in competition. When members of different species try to utilize a resource like light, space, or nutrients, um, that is in limited supply. That is in limited supply, right? You don't have to compete if there's plenty of it. All right, now um, terms. So you have two terms, habitat and niche. So a habitat, a habitat is where an organism lives. So there are several different organisms that are living in this habitat. Can you count the different organisms that you can just visually see? Right, I see at least four there, right? You have dead zebra, you have grass, you have lion, you have scavengers. I don't know if this is a lion or a hyena over here, I cannot tell, okay? So they're all living within the same habitat, but 
what you do is your niche. Okay. And make sure to fill in your notes. Um, the niche is what an organism does. So for instance, these plants, what's their job? Their job is to do photosynthesis, right? They keep the nutrients cycling. The zebra's job is to eat the grass. The lion's job is to eat the zebra, right? So they all have a different role. Um, that's what a niche is. But a habitat, they're sharing that same habitat. All right. Now, um, next, let's um, talk about competition, okay? Now, let's say... Uh, Okay, so if you're competing for a resource, there's there's only a couple of outcomes, right? So if you have a resource that two different species want, then one can get it and one won't. So one could live and one could die. That That is one option. Another option is to share that resource. So maybe one uses it at night, one uses that resource during the day. Um, these barnacles are at the top of the rock. These barnacles are at the bottom of the rock. But no two species can occupy the exact same niche at the exact same time. Okay. And so when you look at that, um, this is called the competitive exclusion principle. And you want to fill in your notes there. No two species can indefinitely occupy the same niche at the same time. The same niche at the same time. Okay. So there are two options. One replaces the other. So you've got P. aurelia grown and here P. caudatum grown, but when they're grown together, they both don't make it. P. caudatum dies, right? And you can see the P. aurelia is, is going to survive. But a second option is that sharing option that I told you about, and that's called resource partitioning. So for instance, here's this whole rock. And in order to decrease competition, these um, these right here are living at the top of the rock. These larger ones are at the bottom of the rock. They're not competing over the whole rock. They're just competing for this place right here in the middle. This would be like maybe if you have a big dog and he likes to sleep on your bed, right? You're going to sleep in one part of the bed and they're going to sleep in the other part of the bed. Or maybe not. Maybe just kick them off the bed. I don't know. So that would be resource partitioning. For instance, here are five different species of warblers. All five species can live right here because they're using different parts of the tree. Maybe one is living where there's new growth, old growth, bigger branches, maybe in the ground underneath it. So they're dividing it up, resource partitioning. All right. A good example of that is Darwin's finches. So originally, maybe there's one, two finches on one island, right? But they're competing for the same resources. But some of those finches had a little bit bigger beak so they could eat bigger seeds. Over time, evolution, that bigger beak, those would, those are the species that would survive and produce, reproduce because they could eat the bigger seeds. And so they go on to make more offspring. You have vast amounts of time. So now you have three different species wash and repeat and do it for other size beaks or feet or using a tool as a um, a stick as a tool. So um, what I want you to have on here underneath resource partitioning is species can shift niches. You have that. They no longer directly compete. So some are eating small seeds, some are eating larger seeds. You can have variation in timing, uh, the area we talked about that. Um, character displacement, this is what you're observing right here with Darwin's finches. Um, differences in morphology, that's structures, okay? Difference in morphology or characters in order to reduce the amount of competition, in order to reduce competition. So because there would be competition, Okay, that you have character displacement then reduces the amount of competition because you're both exploiting a different area of that niche. All right, easy peasy. All right, now your next topic that we're going to discuss here is on, and remember, this is all underneath the bigger heading of regulation of population size. So look what's going on here predator prey dynamics that can definitely affect population size. So here's the snowshoe hare and it's getting um, chased by this lynx. So take a look at if you just kind of study this chart for a minute, I'm going to give you a second look to see the pattern that you find. Do you see that cycling between the two? So, so let's say there's a lot of rain and the number of the bunny, the hare, 
go, goes up because there's so much grass. It was a lot of rain during the spring. So there's a lot of bunnies. Now there's a lot of food for the lynx. So the lynx numbers go up. Then the lynx numbers eat the bunnies, so the bunny numbers go down. There's less bunnies, so guess what's going to happen? The lynx numbers are going to go down. So you have this cycling between the two. So on cycling um, is when a – oh, sorry, predation, going back, when a predator feeds on a prey. Predation is when a pet predator feeds on a prey. And then you have the cycling there, lynx and the snowshoe hare. Now, take a look at that snowshoe hare. Does he have any adaptations that you can see that would help him to be a worse prey so he could get away and not get eaten? Are you thinking? Do you see that he's white, right? Because that could be camo camouflage for him. He's fast. Maybe his senses so he can detect the lynx. Look at some of the adaptations the lynx has. He's large. He's warm. Um, maybe his eyesight is good so he can see that snowshoe hair. So they can push each other to either be better predators or worse prey, right? And um, so they're independent on each other. The rise and fall of the numbers of each group is dependent on the other group. Yeah, that one didn't get away. Bummer. All right. Um, now, this pushing one another is called coevolution when two different species pressure the other. In predator prey relationships, you're trying to be a better predator or you're trying to avoid um, being a prey. And so I believe you have that all in your notes. Yes, the notes that were down at the bottom in the descriptor, right? Um, good. So let's take a look at some anti predator. De oh, one species, sorry, forgot I put this in here. One species adapts to the changes of the other, thereby affecting each other's evolution. So one is influencing the evolution of the other and vice versa. All right, so let's take a look at some plant defenses. So here, what do you see? You see these are pointy, right? You could have stinging nettle, things that are sharp, right? And he's trying to um, not have an herbivore chomp on him. Okay, this is called warning coloration. Now you can see his environment looks pretty green here and some yellow in the background. So if he's red, he's standing out. He's very, very bright. So what do you think that means? Exactly, exactly. He's probably poisonous. So he wants to advertise the fact that he's poisonous. Don't eat the red ones are going to make you sick. Okay, now this one, I think two things are going on here. Um, you can see this is probably maybe some sort of beetle. And he has coverings, right? Um, and maybe those help him to hide. But if at the last second he's not able to hide from you, then maybe he can show you his back and that he has those bright colors. There's some salamanders that will hide at the bottom of water and they try to camouflage themselves. But at the last minute, if you go to eat them, they can flip over and show you a bright colored underbelly, which says, hey, I'm poisonous. Some even take their ribs and poke them through their skin in order to, you know, deter the predator. That, that would work for me. All right, here's another brightly colored frog. Okay, take a look at this picture. Probably you're on a nice screen so you can see it. So notice this, he's, he's trying to blend right into the rocks. Now, one thing that kind of always gets me about this picture is, do you know what's growing on these rocks right here? Do you know what that's called? It starts with an L lichen okay and lichen is a symbiotic relationship two different species in a relationship with each other it uh, could be let's say an algae and a fungus that are in a relationship with one another and they have these different colors there's uh, different types of lichen I just think it's interesting that his fur matches some of the colors in the lichen the plant on those rocks okay here, I don't know if you can see, but right here kind of looks like a caterpillar structure. Notice um, when you have the, the xylem and the phloem and the leaf veins right here, the coloring of his back matches that. You can see the segmentation each. Oh, I don't have a pointer. Sorry. So sorry. Now I have my pointer. My bad. Okay. So you can see right here how it matches the xylem and then each of these are the legs. I was pointing with my mouse and I don't know if you saw that. Okay, I'll have to check that out. All right, um, here's another one. You can see how he blends in perfectly with the rocks. So when you look at um, defenses, when, um, when we look at that underneath anti-predator defenses, you can have plants have spines. 
Um, B, I put down warning coloration. C, you could have poisonous secretions. And D, you already have concealment. All right, let's keep going. Now, take a look right here. Do you see that sometimes predators conceal themselves as well? Okay, I'm sure you see the bee that's right here, but did you see the spider that's right here? Okay, and you can see his legs right here, and you can even see some fangs in there. So that's pretty cool. All right, now this is a puffer fish, and he's trying to startle. Um, so this is the before he was scared. Here's after, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have seen Finding Nemo, so you know all about puffer fishes from that. You're experts, right? Okay. This I think is really interesting. So here is the eye and his head. This is a false head. This whole thing out here is like a balloon he blows up. But what does that look like to you? Yeah, it looks like an alligator to me. It looks like a baby alligator, an angry alligator, right? Here's his eye, like a mean old eyebrow and nostrils. And these look like teeth. Has he ever seen his false head is blue? No. Because those that could serve, those that survive and reproduce, those that look more like something that would help um, protect them, those are the ones that are going to produce the more, most offspring. All right, these eye spots are on its butt. So he's never seen those eye spots. But like if a bird was coming towards his caterpillar to eat it, so here's the caterpillar, here's the bird. The bird's not gonna wanna go right at the head because maybe the caterpillar would try to get away. So it goes towards the tail. So it's going to think that this is the head and it's not. So when it goes towards what the bird thinks is the tail, it's really the head. Maybe the caterpillar can roll off the leaf to protect himself. Or if the bird pecks at it, it doesn't um, impact its ganglia that it would need in order to survive its, its nervous system. Okay, this one's interesting. This is another predator defense and this is called mimicry and this is our next topic on there is mimicry. And this is an, ant. let's get the definition down right now. It's an anti-predator defense where one species resembles another species or something in their environment. Where one species resembles another species or something in the environment, all right? This happens to be a fly that is mimicking a spider. And he literally like moves around like he is a spider, but he is a fly, okay? Now, this is a flower fly, but what does he look like he's trying to be, right? Some sort of bee or wasp, right? Black and yellow, black and yellow. This is called Batesian mimicry. Can you take the bait? It's not named for that, it's named after a guy. But Batesian mimicry is you are tasty, but you mimic something that is distasteful. You're a poser, okay? This does not have a stinger or a bite, but he's mimicking an organism that does. Okay, so that's a Batesian mimic. Okay, here is another Batesian mimic. This is a beetle, again, with the black and yellow. All right, now this is called Mullerian mimicry, and let me explain this, okay? Mullerian mimicry is how... Um, you could have a wasp, a bumblebee, a honeybee. They all have that same black and yellow characteristic, but they are all equally painful if you interact with them. So they're they're trying to up the learning curve by helping you know, hey, malaria that they that they have something that can sting you. So a malarian, the way I remember that is the two L's in malarian, stinger, stinger. They both have stingers. They're both distasteful and they are mimicking each other. So on your notes, let's get these down. So a Batesian mimic, let me go back one, okay? Batesian mimicry, one species that lacks defense, lacks defenses, mimics another that has successful defenses like a fly trying to look like a spider or a beetle trying to look like a bee. So you can put an example down there. A Mullerian mimic, okay? These are several different species with the same protective defenses. They mimic one another, like bees and yellow jackets. They mimic one another, okay. Um, here's a yellow jacket. So that would be a Mullerian mimic with a bee. All right, now moving on, we have two topics left in this chapter. So here's the next one, symbiosis. Um, the close relationship that exists when two or more different species live together. 
So there are actually multiple types of symbiosis. I'm only gonna teach you three that I'm gonna have you know. So let's put this in our notes. Close relationship between members of two different species. And for the ones that I teach you, it's always gonna be good for one of them. It's always gonna work out well for one. So there's parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism. So just guess on those three, looking at your notes, what is what? It's all gonna be good for every, there's gonna be one member of each of those partnerships who it's always good for, okay? So um, if you take this kind of like the shortcut on it on symbiotic relationships in mutualism, think mutualistic, it's good for both species. Parasitism is the other extreme, good for one, bad for the other. Commensalism, it's good for one and, and it doesn't hurt or harm um, the other one. It's not good for them, it's not bad for them. All right, so this is a tick. This tick is either on a dog or an old man, I don't know. So who is it good for? It's good for the tick, right? It's bad for the dog or the old man, right? Because that parasite is on them sucking their blood. So that, if we were gonna put this in as a math, right, we would say plus minus, good for one, bad for the other. And you can put an example down, tick and dog. Okay, here are some other parasites. Okay, an endoparasite lives within the host. This is a tapeworm in the intestines of a dog, I think. And then an ectoparasite right here um, is attached on the outside. One of the things that um, is really concerning is for honeybees, which we are highly dependent upon uh, to pollinate our food sources, there are ectoparasites that are growing on honeybees which are killing them off. And that, that's, a, that's a, a, ca a cause of colony collapse disorder, which is hashtag bad for us. All right, um, here is another um, parasite. It's a leech. Right now, in this case, this is getting used for good, not for evil. Um, in this case, this individual um, had an appendage that got reattached. And so one of the hard things is, is getting all the blood vessels reconnected besides nerves. And so what they do is they can put leeches on the reattached part and then the leech will suck. That sucking action will draw blood up through the tissues of the reattached appendage. So that's cool, right? Yeah. Okay, strep throat, that's a parasite if you've ever had strep throat. Okay, and now here we go with commensalism. This is when it benefits one and the other one's neither help nor harm. So this would be if in math we would say plus zero. So the bromeliad, the bromeliad is an epiphyte. It grows on the top of a tree. It's not stealing anything from the tree, but by being higher up on the tree, it's also getting the light it needs for photosynthesis. It's not taking anything from the tree. So it's good, the plus for the bromeliad, the tree that it's on is the one, it's, it's zero, zero net effect on it, okay? So on that one, commensalism plus zero. Mutualism, just like it sounds, um, both benefits. So for instance, there and there's a lot of cleaning relationships like this. So he's going to eat all the bugs off this. I don't know what kind of bowl. Is that like a Brahma bowl? I'm not really sure. I don't know. Um, anyway, he's eating ticks, so he gets a tasty little meal, and he gets all the things that are bugging him, all the little parasites off of him. Um, here, now... Um, Nemo, people used to, like when I went to school, because I'm old, when I went to school, the Nemo C anemone relationship was characterized as commensalism. In fact, it was the, the typical example of commensalism because it was good for Nemo, right? Good for the clownfish, but didn't help or um, hurt the C anemone. It's been reclassified because the nitrogenous waste of, this, of the clownfish is beneficial. Um, for the C anemone, so that's why it's now been moved over into the mutualism column. Okay, um, bacteria living in our intestines, they can be good if uh, because that bacteria produces vitamins that we need. Now the problem is when you take an antibiotic, um, and the anti-bio means anti-life, the, the medicine affects the ability for bacterial cells to either um, reproduce and make more cell wall or repair the cell walls they have. So it kills off when you take an antibiotic, it kills off all the good bacteria in your body. And that's why after you take an antibiotic, you want to eat like, I don't know, Activa or some culture that has bacteria in it 
to reestablish your good colonies so that bad colonies don't go in there. So bacteria besides um, helping us um, and getting vitamins with us, for us, and maybe partially with digestion, they are also taking up um, space so that bad bacteria don't live there. Um, an acacia tree is a tree and it has these hollow thorns here. And the hollow thorns provide a home for the ants. And um, also the acacia tree provides food for the ants. And then the ants will, um, if an herbivore comes over, they'll swarm all over the herbivore. So it, they are protected. So mutualism is plus plus. Okay, and here's another cleaning relationship. Um, sometimes these mutualistic relationships can turn a little bit parasitic because what can happen is this bird could pull off a tick, which then it makes the, the, the animal will start, the herbivore will start to bleed right there. And then the bird starts drinking the blood as a nutrition. And so, yeah, sometimes it can get a little parasitic. Okay. Here's some other cleaning relationships. Good for both. This one gets a meal and this one gets some dentistry. Um, here's some other cleaning relationships. You cannot see this one, but this is one of my favorite. Um, this is a goby fish and um, some arthropod, um, some crustacean. I can't remember what his, it's a little shrimp, but um, the shrimp is completely blind. He is a big time worker. He likes to dig um, tunnels and he likes to clean. He is completely blind. He takes one of his antenna and he rests it on the goby fish so it's like his seeing eye dog. And so when the goby fish wants to go back in the tunnel, he backs up and he brings then, then the crustacean in the tunnel with them. So, but they can't live in the tunnel. And so the crustacean has to eat. So he will um, go outside, make myself big for just a minute here. He will go outside and he will start foraging for algae and eating it. And let's say he gets his antenna is not on the goby fish and he gets lost and he starts like, ah, I'm lost, I'm lost. The goby fish will swim over close enough so that he can rest it on him and find his seeing eye dog again to guide him back to where they live. So anyway, I think that's a pretty cool one. There are other ones too where um, deer and monkey are in a symbiotic relationship where the monkeys will be up high in the tree and break off branches and drop it to the ground so that um, the deer can eat that. And the monkeys, they can't jump from tree to tree. They have to go down to the ground and walk and then get up into another tree. So while they're down on the ground moving, if the deer sees that there is a predator of the monkey, they start stamping their feet so the monkeys know to scurry up the tree. Anyway, we could talk forever on that and probably let's not do that and um, let's move forward. Okay, so our last topic for this chapter um, is on ecological succession. And just like organisms can change over time, so can um, an ecosystem. So early on in um, an area, let's say that's been cleared by a fire or something, you might will have grasses, they will reproduce rapidly and they'll grow in first. And then you might get some larger plants that then replace the grasses and then some bushes that replace those and then some trees and then some larger trees until you get your climax species for that particular biome. So for ecological succession, it is defined as a change involving a series of species replacements in a community following a disturbance, following a disturbance. So there's primary and secondary succession. And primary succession is when you're starting at the bare minimum. Primary, like the lowest level, you're starting on rock. And for that, um, you're going to have to have a couple of things. Um, you're you're going to need to create soil, but probably some weathering is going to be involved when you're starting on solid rock where water goes in and it expands as it freezes and breaks the rock up. Other living organisms can get in there and help to break up the soil. That's primary succession. takes longer if you're starting there. Secondary succession, you already have soil. Secondary succession and soil, S. S, S. Secondary succession has soil, so it um, regenerates um, faster. So primary succession on your notes is start without soil, you're on bare rock. Secondary succession, return of a community to natural vegetation because it has soil. So it happens a little bit faster. 
a lot faster. Okay, so let's take a look at this primary succession. So there's some sort of disturbance. Here's your rock. Then you have some pioneer species like lichens and moss. And then those pioneer species die and provide nutrients for the next species to grow there and so on and so on. Okay, so that is primary succession. Secondary succession. Um, so here you have this forest and then you have a fire in the forest and then slowly it regenerates. And I will put a link to this. It's Pepperdine over time, over the course of two years, a year and two, actually 16 months. I'm sorry, I couldn't remember. Um, oh, I said five months later, but I do have multiple pictures here showing you how that area changed. So I will show you that in a link. Um, okay. So take a look at this picture. Nothing is new here. Just another way to look at it. Grasses and shrubs, small trees, um, climax forest, and then you have this disturbance and you start all over again. So um, when we think about a disturbance, like I don't know if you've ever noticed or pay attention to, sometimes I'll have fires in Yosemite that will get started um, due um, to a storm and there's some lightning. So it starts a fire and they'll just let them burn. And they let them burn because it cleans out the underbrush. It kind of cleans the house of it, right? And it gives a, plant, a chance for other organisms to reestablish for more trees to actually grow. Some um, tree seeds will not even grow unless they've been scarred by fire. And then that causes them to germinate. So a little disturbance is good. Having a fire every single year in Yosemite, maybe not so good. So this comes from what's called the intermediate disturbance hypo hypothesis. So take, let me see if I have another picture on that. No, I don't. Okay. So if you take a look at this picture right here, let's just analyze the graph for a minute. Okay. So your y-axis here, you're looking at community diversity. Now, when we get into talking about that, you want to maximize diversity in your community. Okay. And we'll talk later about why you want to do that and the benefits of that. It's just more stable if you have greater diversity. So then let's look at frequency of disturbance, okay? So if you have a lot, like it happens rapidly and it's very large, that's what's here on this end, right? A lot of disturbance and it's a very large disturbance, then your community has low numbers. But conversely, if you have a disturbance really infrequently and it's very, very tiny, you also have lack of diversity. So what you want right here, right? This is like not too hot, new cold, not too cold, but just right, um, is the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, which says if you have an intermediate frequency of a disturbance of an intermediate size, that's how you have the healthiest community. So on modes of succession um, summary, intermediate disturbance can be healthy for an ecosystem, can be healthy for an ecosystem. And it's a complex process. Chance has a great deal to do with what gets reestablished in that community um, and the resulting species that colonize there. And they've done some experiments on that. Um, and you know what? That's all. So good job.